Uh, right after I received the Holy Ghost, this man, he went to the altar and repented and received the Holy Ghost a little over 47 years ago. He was as way back when during the time that men worked on the relief, WPA. Now, a lot of you young folks don't know what I'm talking about. But he was a very conscientious, zealous man for God and started paying his tithes from the very time he received the Holy Ghost. And uh, times got better, and he, he got a real good position and held this position until he was 70 years of age and retired. And that man, to my knowledge, paid tithes on every dollar he made from the time he received the Holy Ghost until he died. And I told the congregation, how would you like to have 10% of your life's earnings laid up in heaven waiting for you, been drawing compound interest for 47 years, along with all the offerings that you've given? Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's the place to put your treasures is up there, folks. Up there. Praise the Lord. I enjoyed that Bible school trio. Thank God for young men that are willing to study and dedicate and give their lives to the Lord. Us preachers that's uh, two or three years older than they are, we are we are sure happy to see them come along because we're going to step out of the way one of these days. We sure want this to go on. And it is going on till Jesus comes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Would you stand? And I'll introduce my subject to you tonight. I tell you, this is just something almost uh, unheard of. Uh, uh, camp meeting evangelist getting the pulpit at 745. My goodness. The only one, the only one district I ever preached a camp meeting in, I got the pulpit earlier. And uh, two or three years ago, I preached Tennessee camp. And they made it a point that I got the pulpit at 730. Brother, I've got I've preached camp meetings when you did good to get to pull a pit at 10 o'clock. And then they sit down and groan around and yawn wishing you'd quit. And if you don't put over a sermon, you didn't have a good camp meeting. Brother, this is, this is suiting me fine. Praise the Lord. Thank God. How many of you are happy? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I wish you knew the respect I have in my heart for these gentlemen, my brethren, sitting behind me. I wish you knew the deep respect. I told Brother Kilgore that if he hadn't come to the platform, when I had charge, when I got the pulpit, you see, when I come up here, I'm in charge. This is mine now. <laughs> I'll probably hold it longer than anybody did. I, I said, Brother Kilgore, I just, I just thought, well, yeah, I'm going to call him up. The, Brother Holly is your district superintendent, not mine. He's my real good friend. Brother Neely, he's your secretary. And these presbyters, they are your presbyters, not mine, they're yours. But Brother Kilgore is just as much mine as he is yours. Yes, sir, he's my assistant general superintendent. So I thank God for him. I'll tell you the truth, that little Sabine River don't mean nothing to, to us anyway, does it? We're all in the family of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm reading one verse of scripture, one verse of scripture tonight from the first chapter 
of the book of Job and verse 6. Job chapter 1 and verse 6. I feel this so impressed upon my heart tonight. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. I'm going to read that again. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. Now I'm going to bring it really up to date. This is in the Old Testament, but it's up to date. There was a day, the 17th day of June, 1980, when the people of God of the great Texas district presented themselves before the Lord on the old campground and Satan came also among them. I've underscored those few words and Satan came also among them. And I'm going to preach tonight and it's going to be a very sobering thought. Probably won't be a bit of shouting, but uh, there's more to my salvation than shouting, as much as I like to shout. It'll be thought-provoking. I'm going to minister to you from this thought, Satan among the saints. Satan among the saints. That's no reflection on you. I wouldn't want you to think that it's any reflection at all on you that I say Satan is here among us. Wherever God's people congregate, you'll find him among them. And I'm going to tell you, one thing he doesn't do among us and he'll keep us from doing it if he can and then I'm going to tell you his business here tonight I'm going to tell you his business and throughout this discourse I'm praying that he'll be so discouraged before this service is over he'll wonder if there'll be any need of ever coming back But the only way that we can do that is to completely and altogether ignore him. Don't give him a moment's notice. Don't listen to him talking to you. Don't do a thing he wants you to do. That's the only way you can defeat him. Resist him, he'll flee from you. We don't have to put up with him in here tonight. There's enough of us to drive him off of these grounds. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Now here's one thing he never does. He hasn't done it tonight. And he's kept you from it if he can. He has not worshipped God. He has not said praise the Lord one single time. And I guarantee you there's a bunch of you out there that haven't. Who kept you from it? This pulpit's been begging you to. Who's kept you from it? You that feel you're a little bit behind praising the Lord tonight and listen to the devil and he's kept you from it. You want me to give you a minute to catch up? Praise 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank God. Now, he don't like that. Devil don't like that. He don't like it. But he don't want you to do that. In your, you remember this. In your Wednesday night services at home, he'll sit you on the back seat. <laughs> and he'll keep you from entering into the service. He don't want you singing. He don't want you going to the prayer room. He don't want you praying. He don't want you praising. He's there to keep you from it. Satan among the saints. Now that's one thing he goes for is to keep you from worshiping God. He will not do it, and he don't want you doing it. But, brother, I'm going to look at him right in the face and lift my hands and worship my God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, you may be seated. God bless you. God bless you. Now, I'm going to... I'm going to tell you what he does. And I'm going to give you scripture for it. I'm not going to give you what I think about it. I'm going to give you scripture for it. In one of the parables of our Lord, known to us as the parable of the sower, very beautiful parable, I, I sometimes call it the Pentecostal parable. I could go to any church in Texas and preach that parable and tell you this is the history of your church. The soul seed's been sown from this pulpit for many years, but a lot of it's fallen by the wayside and rocky ground and thorny places, but you that are here tonight, thank God some of it fell on good ground. Jesus said that a sower went forth to sow seed. And some fell by the wayside. And some fell on rocky ground. And some fell in thorny places. But some of the seed fell on good ground. Now he gives us the interpretation of that parable himself. We don't have to try to even figure it out. He gives it to us. He said the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. Well now, who is the sower? Who is the broadcaster? The sower is the one that distributes and sows and broadcasts the seed, the word of God. That's uh, presently your camp evangelist. At home, it would be your pastor or your evangelist preaching the Word of God. Now, I'm only going to use the first thought. Jesus said some of that seed fell by the wayside. And these are they. That seed that fell by the wayside, these are they that hear the word of God. Then cometh the devil, Satan among the saints. Here tonight, out there among you, right where the seed is being sown. He's right there to keep it out of your heart. And anything he can do here tonight to keep it out of your heart, he'll do it. Why does he want to keep the seed out of your heart? The word of God out of your heart, lest you believe and be saved. So that's his purpose here, is to keep the word of God out of your heart. Amen. 
Satan among the saints. That's one reason why I have preached for years with no success. And I'll preach it tonight with no success. But I still believe it. I believe when the minister comes to the pulpit with the unadulterated, infallible word, eternal word of the living God and opens its pages and begins to preach from it, I think it's time for everybody to stop. It's time to stop walking. It's time to sit down and listen to the Word of God. No more going after a drink of water. No more going to the restrooms. No more whispering to your neighbor. Every move you make in the course of this sermon tonight, you're detracting from this service. And the devil wants to detract from it. Lest somebody out there hears the word and believes it and gets saved. But if he can get your mind off of the word and on that person walking, on that person talking, that's what he wants. That's what he's here for. And oh, what services we'd have if everybody would sit down and give ear to the word of God. Forget about your clock. Forget about the time. Praise God and listen to the word. There isn't anything in all of this world as dynamic, as powerful. Praise God as effective upon the hearts of men as the anointed preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I tell you, friend, we're living in a day when we need it. I don't care how much you've heard in the past, you need it tonight. You let one of these, you let one of these people here on this front seat right now. You let them get up, and they're at liberty to do so if they want to. There's no law here to stop them. All we can do is ask and then it's just left up to you as to whether you'll be mannerly and polite enough to, to do it or not. But one of these here in front right now, they could get up and walk out, and they'll have the attention. They'll get the attention of everyone on the platform. They'll get the attention of everybody out there. Now, I've got to keep on preaching, but I've lost the attention of the audience. The devil takes advantage of that and snatches it away from them. What I'm saying has no effect on them whatsoever. They've got to hear it and believe it in order to be saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Lord in his wisdom I never question has chosen hearing. He's chosen hearing to save them that believe. It shall come to pass in the last days whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How can they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? This is God's order tonight. There's a lot of people, and I, I said this one time, and an old veteran in the church reached for his Bible. I said, you needn't reach for it. It's in there. It seemed like most people are of the opinion that everyone in Cornelius' household, when Peter went there to preach, received the Holy Ghost. You've got no scripture to substantiate that. The Bible said... While Peter was yet preaching, they that heard the word were filled with the Holy Ghost. There could have been some there just like some here tonight. They're here and they're hearing the voice, they're hearing the noise, but they're not hearing the word.
But they that heard the word were filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh, I wish you'd open your heart here tonight. You could be filled with the Holy Ghost in this audience while you're hearing the word of God. I hear, I hear a lot of our precious saints. I hear a lot of them preaching around over the country. I hear a lot of them say, oh, I, I wish I had the faith I used to have. I want more faith. I need more faith. Well, I don't suppose anyone would say they didn't need more faith and didn't want more faith. But I can tell you exactly where you get faith. I can tell you where you get it. And it could be the reason you don't have it. Faith cometh by hearing. It didn't say faith cometh by singing. As important as singing is. And I like it as well as you do. And it has its place in the church. But he didn't say faith comes by singing. Faith cometh by hearing. By hearing the word of God. Not by going to church. Not by going to the camp meeting. It comes by hearing the word of God. Sit down where you can hear the word of God. And then sit there and listen to it. Listen. Give ear to it. There's where you get your faith. And the devil's here sitting right by your side, parked up on your shoulder, doing everything in the world he can to keep the word of God out of your heart. If I was you, I'd rebuke him in Jesus' name. You get away from here. You're not going to detract my attention. I'm going to listen to the word of the living God. I've had enough experience pastor and I, I feel like saying a lot of things about it sometime. I, I appreciate our pastors. God only knows what they battle sometimes. And I tell people, when you go to church and your pastor preaches and you go home and say, well, I didn't get nothing out of it tonight. I wonder how much a you paid to it I wonder how much you prayed for him that day I just wonder I just wonder where you sit in the church I wonder how many times you looked at your watch put it up to your ear to see if it had stopped we're getting to the place everything is so streamlined and everything is so fast people I know people that don't want over a 15 minute sermon well I'll tell you this you don't want me That's, that's why you've got sermonette faith. You want sermonette sermons. I tell you what we need is two or three hour Bible lessons. The good sound old word of God. Now that's one reason Satan's here is to keep you from hearing the word of God. Snatching it out of your heart. And saints, please don't assist him. Please don't assist him. Don't you move around and detract and give the devil every advantage to steal the word of God out of the hearts of men and women. I'm a fanatic. I even go so far as to say, you that are sitting up here around the front, don't, don't lean over and whisper to somebody. Isn't that good? You'll get the attention of a dozen people behind you. If it's good, enjoy it. And say nothing about it. Praise the Lord for it. Don't do nothing to detract. Of course, I'm, I'm an old fanatic, but that's me. I wish you'd take it home with you. Now, I got sense enough to know this. There is, there is times of emergencies. 
precious mothers with infant babies crying. We got nurseries and churches for you to take them to. And it's certainly in order for you to do it. I'm talking about the Walker family. Just get up and deliberately walk around. Who is there isn't in this building that couldn't enjoy a cool drink of water right now? But it's no time to go get a drink of water. How'd you like to see me leave this pulpit and go hunt up a drink of water? I got as much right to do it as you have. And I may need it more than you need it. Now, let me, let me go to my second thought. I'm going to ask you this, and I'm going to give you a few moments to think and answer it in your thinking. Why did Satan go into the Garden of Eden? Why did Satan go into the Garden of Eden. Now he went. Here's a great big world out here that he's cast into, cast out of heaven into this great big old world. And in this world, the Lord created a very special place for his people. And this place is called the Garden of Eden. And in this beautiful Garden of Eden, God placed his people, his children, Adam and Eve. And in this garden, he furnished them with everything that they would ever need. All manner of fruit all manner of fruit. I made that statement one time and a Sunday school teacher came to me when service was over and said, Brother Glass, you opened my eyes tonight. She said, I thought there was only two trees in that garden. And that was the tree of life and the tree of death, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I said, the Bible said there was all manner of fruit trees in that garden. God has a variety for us. Not the same thing all the time, but a variety. Sometimes he makes me laugh. Sometimes he makes me cry. Sometimes I feel like I could jump and touch the ceiling. And there's sometimes I wish I could get under the platform. He has a variety for us. And he had a variety for Adam and Eve. Anything they would want and needed was furnished. It was there for them. Theirs. Created for them. And now Satan has a great big world out there. Why won't he stay out there? Why does he have to invade that holy, sacred place that God created purposely for his people. I say this tonight. There's a great big world out there. And Satan's got going on for him about everything he wants tonight. He's got drunkards, gamblers, harlots, whoremongers, thieves, robbers, and you won't have to leave Lufkin to find them. Everything's going on. Why won't he go on out there where all that's going on and enjoy what his children are doing for him? Entertaining him. Why won't he? No. He comes into this dedicated, holy sanctuary that you precious people sacrifice to build, to come here once a year, to have a camp meeting, and refresh yourself and enjoy the blessings of God. And that old devil comes right on these grounds and invades your rights, uninvited, unwanted, but he's here anyway. And he's here for the same purpose he went into the garden. Same purpose. 
Same purpose. And congregation, I hate to tell you this, but we got to preach all the truth, not just part of it. We got to tell it all. I wish I didn't have to tell you this. I wish I didn't. But he was successful in the garden. And I don't want him to be successful here tonight. I want you to respond with me and your heart blend with mine and, and let's just drive him off of these grounds. And let everybody that's not saved get saved. Everybody that needs a revival, get a revival. Well, the only way we can do it is for you to ignore him. Pay him no attention. Rebuke him. Don't let him talk to you. Don't let him use you. Have you decided, have you decided why he went into the garden? I told you I was going to give you a few minutes to study and think in your heart. He didn't go in there to partake of any of the fruit. We don't have any record of where he partook of any of the fruit. He didn't go there for that. He didn't come here tonight to partake. And he is not participating. He's keeping you from it if he can. sure makes me feel bad and I, I'm, I'm just going I'm just going to preach my conviction I, I I never will preach another camp meeting here so I just, I'm not trying to preach real good so I can be invited back I told somebody I got two more to go this year and I said that's all after this this is it I'm through with camp meetings so so no, no use for me to try to put on some flowery preaching here so you'll ask me back I don't want to come back I don't intend to come back to preach a camp. I'll come back and sit back there with you. I will. But I'm going to tell you something. It hurts me. It stirs me. It worries me to see people that will tell me they've had the Holy Ghost 10, 15, and 20 years. And they'll sit in a Holy Ghost service with their feet braced against the service. They're not responding to nothing that's being done. They're critical of a song leader. They're critical of everything that's being done. They're critical of taking an offering when there's as much Bible for taking an offering as there is singing a song. I tell you, friends, that's a devil that makes you a critic. Have you decided? Well, I'll just tell you. I won't make you think any longer. Satan went into the Garden of Eden purposely to encourage Eve and Adam. I'll say Eve first because he started with her. To encourage Eve and Adam to disobey the Lord. Now that is his business. To encourage Eve and Adam to disobey the Lord. The word of the Lord. Now he's in here tonight for that same purpose. I'd have you notice he didn't go in that garden and try to get them to come out of the garden. And I don't know if he's talking to you about leaving the church. He can really use you better in the church playing the hypocrite than he can if you'll get out. Boy, that's preaching, isn't it? Amen. He'd much rather have you an old troublemaker in a church is down in a saloon. Go to church and stir up a stink. Talk against the preacher. Talk against the church. Hey, he'd rather you do that. When you get out of the church, you're talking against the church don't amount to nothing. Whew. 
He did not say one word to them about leaving the garden. He wanted them to disobey God in the garden. And I'm not going to allow myself to even try to believe that an audience of this size can congregate in one tabernacle and every single one of them be a 100% obedient child of God. I'm preaching to some disobedient children. And I'm going to ask you this pointed question. Who has encouraged you to be disobedient? Where did you get your encouragement to be disobedient? Did you get it from the pastor? Oh, you may have used the pastor. Poor fella. Why? Why are you disobedient? And I just well, I just well tell it all. If you aren't paying your tithes, you're disobedient. If you aren't accepting all the teachings of your church, you're disobedient. Who has encouraged you to be disobedient? No one but Satan himself. And you're fighting that battle tonight. My Bible teach me, teaches me God says obedience is better than sacrifice. There is no substitute for obedience. God honors obedience. It wasn't the river Jordan that healed Naaman. It was obedience. Praise God. It wasn't that, uh, it wasn't that time that Peter launched out into the deep and let down his net. It wasn't the boat. It wasn't the net. It was obedience. Praise God. God honors obedience. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking faster than I can preach. I, I wish I could preach fast like Brother Kershaw or some of these preachers up here, but it takes me so long to say such a little. But oh, I want to preach on obedience. I made an extensive study about a subject to you that's simple, but to me it was major. I made an extensive study on the word manna. Manna. Now 95% of God's people feel like manna was given the children of Israel for bread to sustain them. And that was all. But the Bible said God gave them manna to prove them. To prove them. He wanted manna to humble them. And he used manna to prove them. Now how did he use it to prove them? There were some means and ways of using that manna. There's times to gather it and there's times to leave it alone. And the human mind don't grasp that. You go out there one time a day and you gather one day supply. Oh, there's a month's supply still laying out there. But you just gather a one day supply. If you gather a two day supply, it'll spoil on you. Get one day. Now why wouldn't God let them get all they wanted? God's are using manna to prove them. How is he proving them? In obedience. On the Sabbath, day before the Sabbath, the Lord said for you to gather a two-day supply. And I won't allow that second-day supply to spoil. It'll be good for you on the Sabbath. But no other day can you gather two-day supply. 
Now why did God make those restrictions? To prove the people. Why does he make restrictions among us? To prove us. And we're going to go on and do it our way. Do it your way. But you're not there yet. And the Bible said they did not hearken unto the voice of Moses. They went out there and gathered a two-day supply. And it spoiled on them. It stank. That's the reason there's so much stinking around our churches. You told me to say it. That's the reason why they got so many spoiled saints. Pastors got to speak to them a half a dozen times in one of their visits to church and run out to the parking lot and pat them on the back and tell them goodbye just before they drive off. Or they may not come back tomorrow night. Spoiled, spoiled. I'll tell you what I found in my few years of preaching. Wherever I've gone, I have found this. And I was in a church building up in Illinois just a week or so ago and just got there. And I said, well, I can, I can tell you all about the people that sit in these pews before service tonight. Tell you all about them. And a few saints that is there with the pastor showing me their new building. They looked at me. I said, there is some people that come to this church that are so loyal and faithful and true. You can go mark them present for the next 10 Sundays. Go mark them present. Go mark them present every Sunday this year. If, they, if something happens that can't come, they'll call you and you'll have plenty of time to, to change it. They're that faithful. They're that dependable. They're that law. Then their son comes here and sits in these pews. You don't know whether they're coming or not until you see them walk in. And all of you out there, you are one or the other of those I'm talking about. You're one or the other. I say there is a people you cannot pay them. You can't beg them. You can't persuade them. There's nothing you can do that will encourage them to be faithful and true to God. You can pet them. You can call their name from the pulpit. Dedicate songs to them. Dedicate songs to their friends. Call them up. Go see them. But on the other hand, there's some people that comes to that church, you can't run them off. Don't worry about them if you didn't speak to them. If the pastor backslide, they'll stay true. I got to hurry on. I got more to say now than I had when I started. I want to show you, and I believe I've convinced you, that Satan's purpose for going in the garden was to encourage Adam and Eve, or even Adam, to disobey the Lord. I believe you're convinced of that. And I've told you, I confessed that the devil was successful. But I'm fighting him here tonight. I don't want him to be successful here. I don't. Now I want to show you his tactic, his cunningness. Uh, I, I wish, I wish the devil was as he was first pictured to me. This is my first memory of ever hearing anything about the devil. I was in grandmother's lap 
And she was talking to me about the devil. Of course, back in those days, they called him something else, but in some parts of the world, we was down in Australia, and boy, Brother Brian, you don't use this word down there, booger man. Some places don't never use that word. It's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a no-no word. But we call him that. And grandmother called him that. And she pictured him to me. She said he was dressed in an iron suit. Solid iron. He's in hell, you see. It's so he can't, he's got to have something that won't burn up in a child's mind. And he has fiery, blazing eyes. And that fire just shoots out, protrudes way out in those eyes. And he has a long, forked tail and a pitchfork. Now, you've heard that story about him. I wish that was a true picture of the devil. If that is a true picture of him, how far would he have gotten with Eve? If that is a true picture of him, there wouldn't be a vacant seat over here. In fact, you'd pull him up closer to this pulpit. You'd get up as close to the front as you could if that is a true picture. But he don't come like that. He comes as he came to Eve, as an angel of light. I'm going to bring you some light, Eve. And if you'll notice, Eve wasn't afraid of him. She had no fear of him. She didn't run. She didn't tremble. No, no. Some of you sit out there. You got no more fear of the devil. You, you fear a little... Water moxican more than you do the devil. You fear a mosquito more. You have no fear of him. Not a bit. She didn't. And now I want you to watch his approach. I want you to watch it. He wanted to take her mind somewhere. And he knew exactly how to do it. He knew exactly how to do it. And he's doing it with many of you. Many of you. And this is the way he did it. He said to Eve, Hath God said that you could not eat of all the trees of the garden? Like a flash, her mind went right where he wanted it. To that tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's right where he wanted it. And he had his way of getting it there. Wanted her mind on the forbidden. And that's where he wants your mind. And there's a lot of you in this camp that's struggling, battling, struggling to get your mind off of the forbidden. And you'll probably pray through and renew your consecration in this camp. But you'll go home and he'll be there to battle you. To get your mind on the forbidden. Get it off of all that you have. I wish you'd think with me for just a moment. Think of all the trees of that garden. All of them. All of them. Tree of life. All the trees of that garden. My, what, what an abundant supply. What a good God. And why the Lord placed one tree in that garden and said, leave it alone. I'm in no position to explain that to your inquisitive mind if you want to question. But I just know that there's always, always, some restraint, something not to do. Something not to do. That's God's way of proving us to his satisfaction. That's his way. And he placed that tree in their reach and said, leave it alone. And they were getting along very well without it. They haven't gone without a meal. 
They haven't been lacking one thing without that tree. Didn't need it. Getting along good without it. Possibly never even thought of eating of the fruit till the devil came along. And you'd be surprised to know how good you can get along without the devil. And her mind went straight to that tree. And he kept it there. Satan kept that mind there until she ate of that fruit. And he'll keep your mind there until you eat or partake or do what he's encouraging you to do. Disobey the Lord. I wish you'd reason with me and I know you're capable of doing it. Who had more to offer Adam and Eve in that garden? God or Satan? There isn't a sinner in this congregation but what could answer that? That same God lives tonight and he's got just that much more for you than Satan has. No one could ever convince me that the devil, who is the adversary of our soul, he, he's here purposely to kill and to destroy. But Jesus created us in his own likeness and image, went to Calvary for us, shed his blood for us. He loves us far more, far more than Satan could ever convince me that he cares. I don't know why people will even listen to Satan. I don't know. But there's where you are. There's what you're battling. The forbidden. That, that the Bible teaches you to leave alone. And it is so frivolous. It don't amount to nothing. It isn't worth anything to you. It, it, it isn't what you think it is. It isn't. Why, uh, there's, there's some, some men and ladies as well now. that They, they have a battle giving up cigarettes. You're looking at a preacher that bleeds with everything in his heart that he would be in hell right now, this moment, while you're in this camp meeting. Somebody else would be here preaching and I'd be in hell right now if God had not have saved me. Then you try to tell me the devil's got more for me? When I was 21 years of age, tall as I am, and a bean pole. Coughed every breath nearly. I wouldn't go stay all night with nobody. I'd have to tell them all the next day why I coughed all night. My father unsaved, but he came to me, and I wasn't saved. He came to me, and he said, Son, I want to take you to a specialist. I believe you have tuberculosis. And tuberculosis in those days is just as ugly a word as cancer is today. When you heard somebody had tuberculosis, you was expecting to hear of their funeral in the near future. And he said, I want to take you to a specialist. I believe you have tuberculosis. You know the specialist I went to? In just a very short time, I went to an altar of prayer. I repented of my sins. I was baptized in Jesus' name. I threw those cigarettes away. And that's been 49 years ago. And look, I'm preaching tonight. You can hear me downtown. Amen. 71 years of age will be one month from today. I'd be dead and in hell if it wasn't that God saved me. Listen, when I was pastor in Tennessee, there was a young man in the church in, that I was pastoring, attending uh, the University of Tennessee, which is in Knoxville. And he had gone through his junior year. 
Now, his family, some of them was in the church, but he wasn't. He was a sympathizer. He believed in Pentecost, but he wasn't in the church. And he met a very beautiful, nice church girl in his same class. And they dated all through their junior year. And they decided to get married after uh, the junior year. And he's coming to Jackson and get a job and work through the summer and uh, go back to school for their senior year married. Well, he brought her home and brought her to church. First Pentecostal church she's ever in in her life. First one she'd ever put her foot in. She was swept off of her feet. Oh, there were some old deadheads there had been going all their life that went to sleep in the same service. But this brand new person never had been there. Boy, there was something there. Some of the old saints so case-hardened to it, they thought it was dry. But she thought it was a fire. It may be a fire to you if you wake up. That little lady hit the altar. It wasn't no time until she had received the Holy Ghost and I baptized her in Jesus' name. Praise God. Well, those summer weeks flew by. And their last Sunday has come. They're going back to Knoxville that afternoon. And after Sunday morning service, she uh, came to me. Said, Brother Glass, said, uh, as you know, we're going back to Knoxville this afternoon to school. I said, yes, Carol, I understand. I sure, sure going to miss you. She said, I must talk to you. I just must talk to you before I go. I said, all right. And it's out in the foyer, and my study is just off of the foyer. And I said, come in. She came in. I said, sit down, Carol. She said, Brother Glass, I mentioned I'm going back to Knoxville. I want you to tell me before I go back. I just want to tell you how happy I am that I have the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name. But Brother Glass, it's all so new to me. I don't understand too much. All I know is what I've learned since I've been here. And I want you, my pastor, to tell me all the things I can't do now. And I thought, well, bless her little heart. Somebody's already got a hold of her. Trying to tell her what she can't do. Why well, don't you tell them what they can do? There's a lot of backsliders in Texas now because some old saint pounded on them the night they got the Holy Ghost and began to tell them all the things they couldn't do. Why don't you let the pastor do that? That's really his job anyway. Why don't you go out back there in that nursery and wake that little six-month-old baby up and tell it what it can do and what it can't do? We need to give these new converts a little time to cut their teeth. I'm going to leave Carol and go to Annette. I've had a lot of experiences. Yes, sir. A young man and his wife received the Holy Ghost in our church at DeRitter. And uh, neither of their families was in the church. They just come in and got the Holy Ghost. And uh, one Sunday night, Troy, Troy Austin brought Annette, his little sister who was a junior in high school, to church with him that night. That is her first night. And Annette went to the altar and received the Holy Ghost the first night. And she is baptized in Jesus' name. But some lady in the church, she shouldn't have done it. Shame on her. She went running to the telephone, just as hard as she could go. And Annette's mother and dad knew nothing about a Pentecostal church. Didn't know a thing about it. Not nothing. All they knew, their son Troy had got into it, and they didn't know what he was in. And some lady went to the telephone and woke them up. He was a hard-working man, contractor, and said, Mr. Austin, 
you're going to have to buy Annette a brand new wardrobe. Waking a sinner up. Telling him, well, that's as strange a language to him as you could speak. He could understand a foreign language as well as he could understand that. He said to her, what do you mean I've got to buy Annette a brand new wardrobe? Why, she can't wear shorts no more. She can't wear pants no more. She got the Holy Ghost tonight and is being baptized now. He slung up, just hung up on her, just hung up. Went back and woke his wife up, told her all about it. They got up. They were sitting in the living room waiting for that precious little old innocent babe when she walked in. I'm really glad she got the Holy Ghost and didn't get a jabbering experience, a GGGG experience. She got the Holy Ghost. They were waiting for her. When she walked in, him mad, just as mad as he could be, Annette, tell me what you've done tonight. She said, well, Daddy, I went to church with Troy and Linda, and, and uh, I received the Holy Ghost and was baptized. He said, what about this new wardrobe? I want you to know I've got you a clothes closet full of pants and shorts and pants suits, and I'm not buying you no new wardrobe. Well, the poor little old thing didn't know nothing about it. somebody calling him. And she had forethought enough. Her God helped her. She went to crying, and she just went to her bedroom, closed the door, and fell across the bed and went to crying. He, he hollered as he passed the door, You're never going back to that church again. I'll let you know that. Now, that saint had no business of doing that. And if that's your practice, you got no business doing it. Well, poor little old Annette couldn't come back for about a month. But Troy and Linda, they, they worked a shenanigan, if you know what that is. They got ready to go to church one Sunday night early. And they went by to see his dad and mother. And they were visiting. And, and, uh, to, and to give Annette time to get ready, Troy got his dad in a pretty good humor and said, Daddy said, let Annette go to church with us tonight. I'll bring her right home from church as soon as it's over. And of course, God's a working too. He looked around and said, well, I guess she can go. So she went. And I took her in the study. I said, Annette, I've heard all about what you faced. I've heard all about it. Now you and I have got to work this out with the help of God. And God's going to help us. Annette, how many dresses do you have that you can wear to school and to church? She said, Brother Glass, I'm ashamed to tell you, but I've only got three. So now I've got plenty of pants suits and plenty of pants, but, but I don't have but three dresses. I said, Annette, I want you to be the sweetest little girl in all the world. I want you to be that. I don't want you to cross your mother and your daddy. I don't want you to ask them for no clothes. Don't ask them for it. You yourself keep those three dresses in shape to wear. Wear one one day and one the next, one the next. Just wear them. Wear them to church if you get to come. Come every time you can. When you can't, just wear those dresses. Leave those pants suits alone. Leave them alone. Keep them off. Keep them off. Keep them off. And just wear those dresses. And it, it, it got to where on Sunday he would let her come. And she'd have on one of those dresses. Little old angel. She had it on. Loving God, loving God. Praise the Lord. After about six or eight months, I saw Annette coming. She got out of the car with the person she came with. And I was standing in the front door. And here she came with a smile all the way across her face. She had on a new dress, new purse, new shoes. With a big smile, I said, Annette, where did you get your new clothes? Said Brother Glass, Mother and Daddy bought them for me. And said, This is not all. They bought me several more. 
Don't tell me God won't work it out. You leave the forbidden alone and he'll replace it. He'll replace it. It wasn't but about three or four more months. The little old thing drove up in a nice little automobile. Driving it herself. Oh, she couldn't hardly wait to park it to get to the door. And it, where did you get your car? Brother Glass, mother and daddy bought it for me just to come to church. And you that can't give up the forbidden, thinking you won't get nothing in its place, God's got more for you than the devil could ever offer. That's been several years ago. Annette married one of the Christian boys in the church and last Sunday, just last Sunday, she's got two sweet little babies. She's taught those babies. My, our grandchildren call us Papa George and Mama Mert. And, and, and she's teaching those little children to call us Papa George and Mama Mert. And she brought them both to me and said, Papa George is going to Texas, kiss him goodbye. And they kissed me, one on one cheek and one on the other. Boy, I'm telling you, I wouldn't take a million dollars for that little old Annette. That little old Annette. Amen. That little old Annette would not yield to the forbidden. And God gave her everything. Now, I haven't forgot Carol. I haven't forgot her. I'm going back to Tennessee now. <laughs> Folks, get comfortable. I'm warmed up. I said, Carol, we only have a few moments in here together. There's people out there waiting for me, and there's people out there waiting for you. And I'm going to tell you this. I'm not going to take those few moments of telling you what you can't do. I'm going to spend these few moments of telling you what you can do and who you are, where you come from, and where you're going. I said, Carol, I doubt, very seriously, I doubt, I, I, I just doubt if it's ever dawned on you that you are now a child of God. And I'm preaching to people that that hasn't dawned on them. You're a child of God. Washed in His blood. Filled with His Spirit. Buried in His name. I said, Carol, I know you've heard it said, and you may have heard me say it, and I've heard it said since I've been here, and I'll hear it before I leave, and I'll hear it after I'm gone, that God comes into your heart. God dwells in your heart. I said, nowhere in the Bible does it say that the heart is a temple of the Holy Ghost. The Bible don't say that. The Bible said the body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. That's why I get my feet up so high. I used to get them up higher than to do now. But I can't, and my heart still gets up there, but my feet don't. And, and the, the Holy Ghost gets down in my feet. It gets in my hand. It gets in my head. This body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. God said, I'll dwell in them. I'll walk in them. And I said, your name is written in the book of life. You're washed in his blood. You're buried in his name. You're filled with his spirit. You now belong to the church of the living God. Not just this assembly here. But this church started on the day of Pentecost. You belong to the church that Mary belonged to. You belong to the church the apostles belonged to. You belong to the church that, that you read, read about in the book of Acts. You belong to that same church, Carol. You belong to it. And when you realize who you are, when you go to the department store, you won't have a bit of trouble buying a dress that's modest for you to wear. You won't want to put nothing else on that I own a body that God dwells in. 
Why, you don't want to walk down the street and God dwelling in your body in garments that God would be ashamed for uh, you, you to be seen in. You don't want that, Carol. You don't want it. You, you, you'll be happy. You'll be happier in a modest dress. You won't have a bit of trouble staying out of the beauty parlors and barber shops, Carol. You won't have no trouble keeping that paint off of your face. You won't have a bit. You're a child of God. She had a smile on her face. Brother, she was somebody. She was going somewhere. Instead of tell, pounding on her with all the things that she can't do. And I'm preaching tonight, tonight to people that's fighting, that's battling against those things you know it's wrong for you to do. What do they amount to anyway? They're so frivolous, so foolish, so empty. The great old holiness preacher Buddy Robertson said, people's always talking about what to give up said, all I had to give up to serve God was a deck of cards, cob pipe, and an old rusty pistol. In reality, what have you given up? You haven't given up, but very little. I tell you what your trouble is. It isn't the world. It's the love of it. And you can let the love of the world send you to hell and never have none of the world. And there's your battle. It's the love of the world. The lust of the flesh and the pride of life. There it is summed up in those three statements. And this all passes away with the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. My friends, get your mind off of what you give up. I'm ashamed to even mention what I give up when I think about what I've received. I'd be, I'd, I, I know I'd, if I was on a platform or if I was in a service anywhere and one of my children get up and talk about what they sacrificed to be my child, I know I'd feel like slipping out at the back door and, and, and never coming back in here. And I've heard people that didn't have nothing in this life, nothing, nothing to speak of, just existing. I've heard them get up and testify publicly what all they gave up to serve God. What all they gave up and sacrificed to serve God. I know the Lord hates to hear you say that. Why don't you get up and talk about what you've gained? Whew. Let me pass on from that. I'm going to the first church of Jerusalem. Oh, what a church. What a church. This is before anybody left Jerusalem that we have any record of. And I think according to what we can gather from history now, there must have been somewhere between 85,000 and 90,000 members of the church in Jerusalem. Boy, that's a church. They couldn't all assemble at one place to worship. They had to come and go, come and go. And I'll prove it to you in a few moments. Well, somebody preached a sermon in that uh, Jerusalem church and, and God so anointed them in, in preaching that sermon I don't know what the text was I wish I knew I wish I had a tape of it I'd do like a lot of people are doing mine I'd sell them all over the country and pocket the money that's what they're doing I guess that's going on up yonder right now I, I, I don't care it's alright with me I got a copyright on nothing but one of those preachers preached such a sermon and the Holy Ghost used it to move on that entire congregation, that entire church to sell everything they had and bring the money and lay it at the apostles' feet. Boy, wouldn't that work here if we could somebody do that? I wish I could do that for you. <laughs> I wish I could. I... I'm going to indulge her and tell you, I, I, I thought a lot about that. I thought a lot about it. And I thought, I, I believe I know why that happened. I believe I know why that happened. 
God knows our tomorrow. And God knew in a short time Titus is going to overthrow Jerusalem and take it, run everybody out. Now, you wouldn't know what that would be. Brother, Brother Kershaw could tell you what that would be to just have somebody to come in, take you home away from you, and put you out at the back door and keep furniture and everything else. He's gone through it. But uh, God knew that as coming to Jerusalem. And so instead of his people losing their property, he just moved on their heart to give it to him. Give it to the church. Titus won't get it. And I know when Titus eventually got there and run all the saints out of Jerusalem, I know they went out with a skip thinking, I'm glad. Oh, how glad I am that I sold my property and gave it to the Lord. And Titus didn't get it. Well, I got to hurry along. I'm afraid you're going to get through before I do. Now, belonging to that church was a man and his wife named Ananias and Sapphira. And they had a little family conference at home before they went to church that morning. Ananias was going to the first service, and Sapphira would go later on. They wasn't going to the same service. I told you they couldn't all go at the same time. And they decided that they was going to keep back a part of the price. Keep back. They, they agreed to that. They had a conversation at home. I hope there wasn't no children around to hear it. A lot of saints' children going to hell because mother and dads talked against the church, the preacher, and turned the children against the church, against God, against everything in it. Well, uh, because that's all they hear at home. I hope there wasn't no children here in Ananias and Sapphira. But they agreed. Peter happened to be uh, on the platform or at the podium when Ananias walked in. And Ananias, he came right on up to, I'll say, the altar. He came right on up where they were placing the money. And, and he started to place his. And Peter didn't say, Ananias, come here. I want to see you back here in my office. He didn't say, Ananias, step aside here. I want to say something to you. He said, Ananias, why have you allowed Satan, Satan among the saints, to put it in your heart to hold back a part of the price? Satan among the saints. And you folks listen to me. Ananias fell dead. I have no record of Ananias ever smoking a cigarette. I've got no record of him ever drinking a mild can of beer. I've got no record of him ever looking at a movie. Got no record of him ever going to a ball game. Got no record of him ever cursing. Got no record of him ever committing adultery. Got no record of him sinning, doing the things that we all preach against you doing. But Ananias went to hell from an altar in a church. Ananias didn't go to hell from a harlot's house. He didn't go to hell from a drinking house. He didn't go to hell from a theater. He went to hell from the place of worship. At an altar holding back from God. Go on and hold back. Who put it in your heart to do it? Peter said, Satan put it in Ananias' heart. And I'm going to say this, if anybody in this audience is holding anything back from God, Satan put it in your heart to do it. Oh, I want to drive him out of here tonight. Whew. I wish you folks would help me drive him out. Of course, I've got your mind on money. But that's not all you've got that God wants. That's not all you can hold back from God either. Of course, you better not hold, you better not hold that back. But that's not all you can hold back. I'm gonna take you top of old Mount Moriah with with Isaac and 
Abraham. Abraham has Isaac strapped on the altar. He has a knife in his hand. He's ready to sacrifice him. In a split second before he did, God said, Abraham. And he said, here am I. Oh, that's simple words. That's simple words. But when he calls my name, I want to be able to say, here am I. Right where you told me to be. Doing exactly what you told me to do. Brother, you better want to be there. He said, now, Isaac, don't you, don't you take the life of your only son, Isaac. For now, now, for now, I know that you will not withhold your son from me. Oh, but Brother Glass, God knows all things, foreknows all things. I don't disagree with you. But you're going to have to agree with me. He said, now I know. Now, as if I didn't know until now. He blotted all of that out and left Abraham strictly on his own initiative to do or don't. That's where he's left you. Now I know you will not withhold. I'm coming to a conclusion. You don't only withhold finance from God, but you can withhold your worship from Him. And some are doing it in this camp meeting. You can withhold your influence from Him. Some are doing it in this camp meeting. There are some in this camp meeting, if they come up to the front and get into it, there's others that follow them up here and get into it. Brother, that's, that's just all right. And I told you I'm not trying to pat nobody on the back and rub the fur the right way so I can come back. <laughs> not worried a bit. But it's a truth. It's a truth. It's a truth. I'm going to say it. I have been dealing with camp meetings ever since I've been in the church as an official and an evangelist. And when I see a pastor get into a camp meeting with his influence, his prayers, his spiritual support, I see his church into it. Amen. There went a hundred dollars off for tomorrow night's offering. Praise God. Oh, the Lord needs your influence. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to just think this with me. Just think it with me. Just think it with me. What if everyone here on the campgrounds would hold nothing back from God? Nothing. Hold nothing back. That actually belongs to it. Don't hold it back. What would happen before this is over? What would happen before this is over? What would happen? What would happen? But Satan puts it in their heart to hold back, hold back, hold back. I'm going to quit. I'm not through. I'm going to make the most unusual appeal. Oh, I've never heard of anyone else making it, but I'm going to make it tonight. I'm going to give you a few moments to think because you're going to have to think it through before you do it. Instead of you giving it a thought, what would the Lord have you do tonight? I'm going to ask you to think what would Satan not want you to do. What is it you know you could do tonight that the devil don't want you to do it? You're thinking, I want you to do that. I want you to do it. I want you to do what you know in your heart the devil don't want you doing. If it's go from this side of the building to that one over there and ask somebody to forgive you. 
If it's to pay up some back time, whatever it is, it's hell, Satan, don't want you doing. And you know he don't. I'm going to ask you to do that tonight. You that know the devil don't want you coming up here to the front and praying through all over again. Rededicating your life. Reconsecrating your life. You know he don't want you to do that. I want to see you do it. I want you to, I want to see you do it. You that are lost here tonight and you know hell don't want you saved. I want you to come and let the devil see you come down this aisle. Turn your back on him. Satan, I'm getting away from you. Let me tell you, church, we don't have to put up with him tonight. We've got the authority to rebuke him in Jesus' name. Resist him and he'll flee from us. From us. He'll flee from us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Brother Holly made me think of a funeral I preached just a few weeks ago. Uh, right after I received the Holy Ghost, this man, he went to the altar and repented and received the Holy Ghost a little over 47 years ago. He was as way back during the time that men worked on the relief WPA now a lot of you young folks don't know what I'm talking about but he was a very conscientious zealous man for God and started paying his tithes from the very time he received the Holy Ghost and uh, times got better and he, he got a real good position and held this position until he was 70 years of age and retired. And that man, to my knowledge, paid tithes on every dollar he made from the time he received the Holy Ghost until he died. And I told the congregation, how would you like to have 10% of your life's earnings laid up in heaven waiting for you, been drawing compound interest for 47 years, along with all the offerings that you've given. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's the place to put your treasures is up there, folks. Up there. Praise the Lord. My, I enjoyed that Bible school trio. Thank God for young men that willing to study and dedicate and give their lives to the Lord. Us preachers that's uh, two or three years older than they are, we are we're sure happy to see them come along because we're going to step out of the way one of these days. We sure want this to go on. And it is going on till Jesus comes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Would you stand, and I'll introduce my subject to you tonight. I tell you, this is just something almost uh, unheard of. Uh, uh, camp meeting evangelists getting the pulpit at 745. My goodness. The only, one, the only one district I ever preached a camp meeting in, I got the pulpit earlier. And uh, two or three years ago, I preached Tennessee camp. And they made it a point that I got to pull a pit at 7.30. Brother, I've, I've preached camp meetings when you did good to get to pull a pit at 10 o'clock. And then they sit down and groan around and yawn, wishing you'd quit. And if you don't put over a sermon, you didn't have a good camp meeting. Brother, this is, this is suiting me fine. Praise the Lord. Thank God. How many of you are happy? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I wish you knew the respect 
I have in my heart for these gentlemen, my brethren, sitting behind me. I wish you knew the deep respect. I told Brother Kilgore that if he hadn't come to the platform, when I had charge, when I got the pulpit, you see, when I come up here, I'm in charge. This is mine now. <laughs> I'll probably hold it longer than anybody did. I, I said, Brother Kilgore, I just, I just thought, well, yeah, I'm going to call him up. Yeah. The, Brother Holly is your district superintendent, not mine. He's my real good friend. Brother Neely, he's your secretary. And these presbyters, they are your presbyters, not mine. They're yours. But Brother Kilgore is just as much mine as he is yours. Yes, sir, he's my assistant general superintendent. So I thank God for him. I'll tell you the truth, that little Sabine River don't mean nothing to, to us anyway, does it? We're all in the family of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm reading one verse of scripture, one verse of scripture tonight from the first chapter of the book of Job and verse 6, Job chapter 1 and verse 6, I feel this so impressed upon my heart tonight. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. I'm going to read that again. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. Now I'm going to bring it really up to date. This is in the Old Testament, but it's up to date. There was a day the 17th day of June, 1980, when the people of God of the great Texas district presented themselves before the Lord on the old campground, and Satan came also among them. I've underscored those few words. And Satan came also among them. And I'm going to preach tonight, and it's going to be a very sobering thought. Probably won't be a bit of shouting, but uh, there's more to my salvation than shouting, as much as I like to shout. It'll be thought provoking. I'm going to minister to you from this thought, Satan among the saints. Satan among the saints. That's no reflection on you. I wouldn't want you to think that it's any reflection at all on you that I say Satan is here among us. Wherever God's people congregate, you'll find him among them. And I'm going to tell you one thing he doesn't do among us, and he'll keep us from doing it if he can. And then I'm going to tell you his business here tonight. I'm going to tell you his business. And throughout this discourse, I'm praying that he'll be so discouraged before this service is over. He'll wonder if there'll be any need of ever coming back. But the only way that we can do that 
is to completely and altogether ignore him. Don't give him a moment's notice. Don't listen to him talking to you. Don't do a thing he wants you to do. That's the only way you can defeat him. Resist him, he'll flee from you. We don't have to put up with him in here tonight. There's enough of us to drive him off of these grounds. Praise the Lord. Now here's one thing he never does. He hasn't done it tonight. And he's kept you from it if he can. He has not worshipped God. He has not said praise the Lord one single time. And I guarantee you there's a bunch of you out there that haven't. Who kept you from it? This pulpit's been begging you to. Who's kept you from it? You that feel you're a little bit behind praising the Lord tonight and listen to the devil and he's kept you from it. You want me to give you a minute to catch up? the Lord. Thank God. Now, he don't like that. Devil don't like that. He don't like it. But he don't want you to do that. In your, you remember this. In your Wednesday night services at home, he'll sit you on the back seat. <laughs> and he'll keep you from entering into the service. He don't want you singing. He don't want you going to the prayer room. He don't want you praying. He don't want you praising. He's there to keep you from it. <laughs> Satan among the saints. Now that's one thing he goes for is to keep you from worshiping God. He will not do it, and he don't want you doing it. But, brother, I'm going to look at him right in the face and lift my hands and worship my God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, you may be seated. God bless you. God bless you. Now, I'm going to... I'm going to tell you what he does. And I'm going to give you scripture for it. I'm not going to give you what I think about it. I'm going to give you scripture for it. In one of the parables of our Lord, known to us as the parable of the sower, very beautiful. Please like, comment, and subscribe.